Comedy Files. All things creepy, cryptic, and otherworldly. They're listening to Oddity Files, the podcast. podcast. That's probably the worst one we've ever done. But <laughs> for those listening, we are recording remotely. We've got a video feed of each other. It's yeah. as close to as Clayton can be to in the podcast dungeon as possible right now. So we're very excited. I haven't talked to you in freaking eons. I know. Absolutely. It really insane. has been since. I mean, basically, Richmond Galaxy Con. Oh, shit. The anything we have said to each other has had to do with the day job. Absolutely. Absolutely. But so we can catch up. This can be a two hour episode. I don't even freaking care unless you've got (laughs) things to do. I don't have things to do. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, No, it is crazy. I mean, um, just it feels like everything. And this is all I'll say about it. Just like went from being like, oh, a little scared to. Oh, <laughs> yes. And then causing our day job like to just go crazy. I, know. <laughs> I, I, it, I try not to think about it because it's freaking terrifying. So that's why we're yeah, here providing terrifying. entertainment to the masses. Um, exactly. Anything creepy going on with you? Any spooky? Any? Well, sort of. Ooh. Um, we've like around the house just had like a couple off things happening um speaking of we dj jimmy wah wah is back dj jimmy escaped the cruise ship and is home (laughs) praise all that is holy yes yeah so coda will just like perk up her ears like when someone's at the door or something like she'll perk up her ears or like ups you know she just perks up her like you can tell when she is like listening to something yeah and she's been doing that and, like, looking intently in directions. Like, she'll do that and then just look at what? something and, like, freeze. And we just keep saying, like, okay, I gotta stop it. <laughs> like, <laughs> knock that off. Um, but then sometimes, because our bedroom, when you walk out of the bedroom, it's, like, a longer hallway and that comes out into, like, the main living room. And there's been a couple times we've had our door open and she'll just stand there looking down that hallway like no. you can tell she's looking at something yeah and so and again we're just like uh-huh, cut that out <laughs> like, <laughs> what are you doing <laughs> creeping um, me out girl yeah exactly but then the other day so we have this little space heater that when our house used to be you know an ice box we just ran it but kylo just loves it so we just have it on all the time for kylo because he lays next to it Aww. and the other day we were sitting just watching tv and it's like on solid ground, you know. It's not like wobbly. Like it's a it's a heater, so it doesn't. It wouldn't be good if it just casually fell right. over. And we were watching TV. I was standing in the kitchen. James was sitting on the couch. Neither of the dogs were near the heater, and it just goes bloop. No. And falls over. Oh. And shit. W- James and I looked at each other, and I was like, "Did you bump that?" <laughs> and he was like, "No." I was like, "Are like are you sure you didn't bump it though?" Like. Like, just, like, not realizing it, like, grabbing something. Right, like, right. I didn't, I didn't move. Like, and neither of the dogs were near it. So we are like, that's fine, too. Like, <laughs> let's ignore that. <laughs> As well. Um. <laughs> um, and then, do you remember at my old house how the Xbox would just turn itself on every now and then? But yeah. mainly, like, in line of sight like you would be walking by that room and it would turn on like it ne- mm-hmm. it was never just on it like made sure you saw it on <laughs> or turn right. on so james and i were in our bedroom and i don't remember what we were talking about i think we were like acknowledging like coda being weird and all of a sudden you hear the do 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 no of the xbox in the living room so i don't play video games like but because of the things of the world, I've, you know, plugged it You've back in. You've whipped out, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, we heard that, and I was like, no way. So I walk out into the living room, like, I'm not scared of no ghost. <laughs> and 
sure enough, the Xbox is on, TV is not on, the controllers aren't on. Like, how? The only way to turn it on would be to touch it, you know? The fuck? <laughs> and so I was just like, and it hasn't turned on since. It was just at one time, which makes it even stranger. Because at the old house, we kind of narrowed it down to, because I did all the Googling. And every now and then, if an Xbox is close to a garage door opener, um, that'll actually turn on an Xbox. Oh, it's that's like the same frequency of the controller or whatever. And the room that it was in was directly above our garage. Okay. So anytime that like that the garage door mechanical part would like cycle or anything like that, it would just trigger the Xbox to turn on. There aren't any garages around where it is now. <laughs> oh no. We used to have like um some not Alexa lights, but uh or yeah, Alexa lights. Oh, don't worry. Uh, and they um we don't have any of those in that room no like they're not even close we only have one actually plugged in in our house right now and so yeah it was just an anomaly it happened once we'll see but it was funny because it was maybe the next day i did uh, i redid those videos for patreon and i was sitting up in our guest room and i had the door closed and I had that like sage kind of just like going the entire time. That it was just sitting By on your table it, making me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> By Fire. the end of it, um, that room was like full of smoke. And like a smoke detector went off, you know. So that room oh, is shit. clean. <laughs> but when I opened the door, obviously within like 20 minutes, the entire house smelled of sage. Mm-hmm. But nothing's happened since. Ooh. And Coda hasn't done it since interesting and coda wasn't eating which is really odd like coda just stopped eating and um now come to think of it ever since the sage bomb (laughs) really Hmm. yeah i don't know so weird did i told james i was like none of this was happening before you got home i was literally gonna ask did it start after he got home (laughs) yes oh my what did you bring from (laughs) C. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Haunted cruise ship. Anyone? Yeah. Um, so really weird shit going on here. Did you see the video I posted? Yes, I did. So yeah. Um, for those who haven't seen it, it's, it's on my Instagram page at Kitsy Duncan. It's in my highlights. I was, do- Tiffany Rice had messaged me. She's like, let's get on Instagram live. And I'm like, yay, yeah. we'll totally do that. And I spent like an hour setting up the lighting you know our little interview lights see how behind me it's all lit up like that it was similar and every chance i get where i can watch myself on video i will light up these shelves again so i'm hoping it'll happen again absolutely but we were talking about which isn't in the video we were talking about the facts that ghosts follow you home and i don't understand why just saying you can't follow me home works because with real life people that wouldn't work you still get stalkers you know what i'm saying and I brought up Anna, and I brought up um, Abby. Those are the two I felt followed me, ho- followed me home. I didn't know Abby followed me home until you know when it went down. Um, right. And not even, not even ten minutes later, maybe even five minutes later, the, I'm talking. We're cutting up. We're laughing. It's kind of how it ha- goes down when we're on investigations, when we're not paying attention to anything, and we're having fun, and the energy levels are high and light and things like that. I, I missed the first shadow. It just kind of went behind me here on the shelves, but I saw the second one. And yeah. so the lights down on the floor, actually you can see it in this video here. Um, and it was sitting behind that red chair behind me. And I still don't know what it was. I instantly thought it was Anna and Abby. Tiffany thought maybe it was Trixie and Tasha, which were my dogs that passed in the last right. year. Um, I, I've been kind of freaked out ever since. I'm do you, because when you turned around, you're like, "What was that?" And you like start messing with stuff. Then like you see your hand, like cast a shadow later. Right, and I when it happened, I brought my hands out from in front of me. They yeah, were that's not what I was gonna me. ask. Like, what? I mean, was there anything else? You were sitting in the red chair. Yes, in the chair you chair? normally podcast in. Yeah, and I just so had it weird. in front of the shelves. 
and um, you see, you can see the light right there, how it's kind of just yeah. all the way down tilted up. And I had another one, like you taught me, reflecting off the white door over um, across the room here. So nothing happened over there. But still, I mean, it was just, and one came straight down and over, and the other one just yeah, showed up that's, and went over. That's what was so weird is it just wasn't consistent and it didn't like match any of your movements. Whereas like typically if we catch something on IR, we can narrow it down like, oh, that was your foot. like. Or, oh, yeah. But, yeah. Sometimes it takes no. me a, two days to figure out it was a foot, but I usually figure but out still, it was like, a foot. The way they were moving just didn't match anything. It was crazy. No, it was crazy. And we'll put that in the Instagram stories if you guys want to follow yeah, us on absolutely. Instagram. It's at Oddity Files. I should probably take a little gander at our board over here. You are listening to Oddity Files. We are a creepy, cryptid, otherworldly podcast. We're here to entertain the masses, and um, we find creepy shit on the internet. We find interesting, and we hope you do too. I'm Kitsy Duncan. And I'm Clayton Abbott. And welcome. Welcome to our show, if you will. Um, guys, we have a contest that ended this week. Let me let me draw a winner, shall we? Perfect. Um, so if you're listening and you're thinking, what on earth is she talking about? We hold monthly contests where if you go to Amazon Prime, where we have three seasons of our TV show, if you go to Apple Podcast, really any platform that you're able to leave a review on, we um, just leave us a review, screenshot that, and then email it to oddityfilescrew at gmail.com. And once a month, we draw randomly out of all those people, and we send that person just some Oddity Files swag. It's never really the same. Sometimes it might be more, sometimes it might be less. It's kind of just like whatever we do that month, but that's the contest that she's talking about. So starting April 1st, so if you're listening to this a few days ago, we have started a new contest. So again, anywhere Oddity Files related that you're able to leave a review, it can be any of the ones I mentioned before, IMDB, literally anywhere that you can leave a review to screenshot that and email it to oddityfilescrew at gmail.com and that automatically enters you to win. And it totally means we're buying your reviews and we thank you for doing that. Our winner this month <laughs> is Sherry S. I don't want to give her last name just in case, but I'm going to read her review on yeah. iTunes. She said, I am totally obsessed with this show and podcast. I've listened to them back to back lately and get super excited every time there's a new podcast. I listen going to and from work and anytime I'm in the car. It's amazing hearing all the history and stories you guys find. The show itself is truly amazing. I love how wonderful and passionate you guys are with the spirits and can't stop watching them. I love this girl. I'm constantly in chills every time a voice comes through. I believe I watched all three seasons in a matter of three days. <laughs> uh, keep up the great work, you guys. Can't wait for season four. Yes, I can't wait for season four as well. Um, but Sherry, send us an email again, oddityfilescrew at gmail. Give me a mailing address so I can get that stuff out to you. I've got a lot of time on my hands, so I will get it out in a timely manner. <laughs> <laughs> I do have some paranormal in the news, Clayton. You ready? Ooh, okay, yeah. I don't know if you've heard about this or not, but this was kind of huge last week. Um, how a ghost nearly ruined the Foo Fighters' 10th album. No. This is from Rolling Stone. Rolling Stones, I'm sorry, rollingstone.com. The Foo Fighters reportedly faced something entirely new while making their upcoming 10th album, Ghosts. Dave Grohl recently told Mojo that the house in Encino, California, a 40s construction where they recorded, had a sinister pass. Do, 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 do. When we walked into the house in Encino, I knew the vibes were definitely off. Dave's our kind of guy. He just knew. Yeah. He goes, but the sound was fucking on, Grohl said. According to NME, we started working there, and it wasn't long before things started happening. We'd come back to the studio the next day, and all of the guitars would be detuned. Or the settings we'd put on the board, all of them had gone back to zero, he continued. We'd open up a Pro Tools session, and tracks would be missing. 
there were some tracks that were put on there that we didn't put on there. Just like weird open mic no noises. Way. Absolutely. It's so cool. Um, he says, nobody's playing an instrument or anything like that. Just an open mic recording in a room. God, I wish they would have gotten some EVPs. Um, he said, and we'd fucking zero in on sounds within that, and we didn't hear any voices or anything really decipherable, but something was happening. If you go on into it, I guess he, in order for Dave to get the information about this house before um, it, what would be causing this kind of thing, he had to sign an NDR because the guy's trying to sell the house. Oh. So he can't say what happened there. Oh, no. But let's go buy the house. <laughs> I mean, the amount of places that have been for sale that we've been like, let's buy that. (laughs) Let's buy it. Yeah, absolutely. But I thought that was really fucking cool. And I love how Dave's a potty mouth like me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Guys, check us out on all the socials. We're at Oddity Files on Twitter, on Instagram. We also got a Facebook fan group page. I have been getting on and going live on because I need an excuse to shower and dry my hair and put on some makeup. So I've <laughs> been trying to do those once a week just for shits and giggles. Maybe we can talk Clayton into doing one as well. We've also got a show on Amazon Prime. Clayton, take it. Yeah, so we have a paranormal investigative show on Amazon Prime. Uh, we have three seasons on there. Don't bother with season one and two to start with season three. <laughs> And then once you come to love us, then go back so you can appreciate it for what it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's kind of how it actually is how this podcast got started. Um, the TV show has been around longer than the podcast. So if you are into those ghost hunting shows, um, we do investigate a little bit differently. We don't necessarily chase the ghost and force them to do tricks. We just kind of ask them to do what they want to do. And most of the time they do. Yes. And I want to give a big shout out to our Patreon members, especially our producer friends who are Doug Malden Locke, Donald Blanchflower, and Ryan Hoke. Look, Clayton, I didn't look at the board. I finally have them memorized. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you guys. Yes, thank you guys so much. Thank you to all of our Patreon subscribers. Um, you seriously don't know how much it means to us, and uh, your just continued support through everything regardless of what's going on in the world we just appreciate it so much and i've opened up when i add um videos that used to just be for uh patreon members that had subscribed for five dollars more or more a month i've just opened it up to everybody and we do have a dollar a month you can give a dollar a month it's just extra content and a way to you know entertain i guess i i am having fun with it how about you yeah, absolutely. Well, it's kind of just like a way to uh, to get to know us better as well. Just kind of know mm-hmm. um, the type of people that we are not only when we're investigating or talking on the podcast. I know especially people that only listen to the podcast that don't necessarily know the, the TV show. It's really, I mean, they know our voices, <laughs> you know, and that's really it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's just a fun way for you guys to get to know us. Like I told like a more in-depth story about my childhood experience um and yeah you just get to see kind of that side of us maybe yeah. i'll just and like, it's been do a... some fun things that have nothing to do with the paranormal oh you totally should just like yeah i don't me. i mean my life is the paranormal right now i don't know what That's i would true. do <laughs> um i've been in talks to uh start getting our our live podcasts going again, a couple local places here in and around um, central Indiana. So hopefully those will pan out. Everything's kind of been put on hold, but we're hoping to get those going again, which should be interesting because our day jobs are going to get kind of nutty here this sure. summer. So, yes. um, but we'll make it work. We always do. And yeah. it's it'll be fun just to get out there again. Big fan of that. Also, I've been adding, for those of you that don't know, I've been adding a couple more odisodes up just to get some extra stuff for you guys to listen to. I know people have got some time on their hands and are looking to be entertained. So I've been having some of my friends on by this remote recording like we're doing now. 
and um, just talking paranormal with, you know, your everyday people. I've had uh, my friend Tiffany Rice on from TiffanyRice.com. KJ had an episode go up this week. She has a psychic cat, and I wanted to know more. <laughs> and next week, I've got a, a, an episode, go, an episode going up with my friend Ty Gowan from um, the Haunt Me YouTube Paranormal Series. Oh, awesome. So, um, yeah, I'm just reaching out to everybody, and every, I just want to talk to people. Yeah. No, <laughs> that makes total sense. Yeah, for sure. I got stories. I do have stories. You went first last week with Papa Legba. Okay, so, so it's all you. I am going to do a very interesting story that it's something that's like more along the lines of stuff I would usually do, but I've just never heard of it, um, which isn't too strange, but it's also strange. Yeah. So I'm going to do the disappearance of the Eileen Moore Lighthouse Keepers. What? You heard about this? No. And okay. I'm so excited. So on December 26th, 1900, something strange and unexplained happened on the largest of the Flannan Islands, which are islands off the coast of Scotland. So also, who knew Scotland had so much stuff going on? I don't know. I love it there, and I want to go to there now. Well, maybe in a couple weeks. Yeah, sure. (laughs) (laughs) So three lighthouse keepers disappeared into the night, never to be seen again, and their mysterious disappearance still baffles historians and scientists to this day. Three lighthouse keepers, Captain Thomas Marshall, James Ducat, and Donald MacArthur, vanished on the island without a trace, leaving nothing but speculation. So a small ship was sent to the Flannan Islands in the remote outer Hebrides. I'm guessing that's like the group of islands. Okay, gotcha. Its destination was the lighthouse at Eileen Moore. Named after St. Flannan, a 6th century Irish bishop who later became a saint, the island was completely uninhabited apart from the lighthouse keepers. So, let me go back to Mr. St. Flannan. Okay. The history of this island actually starts back in the 7th in the seventh century. Okay, so like a oh. long ass time ago. Way the Local, fuck back. <laughs> yeah. Local and religious folklore believe that St. Flannan built a chapel on the island and that he and a circle of his followers inhabited and worshipped on this island, thus the namesake for the St. Flannan Isles. Gotcha. Although the island seemed to be the perfect place to establish a congregation, which I don't know if I believe because I'll show you a picture. If you're thinking island, like, massive island, like, it's maybe three football fields. Oh, like teeny tiny. Yeah, not a big island. Although it seemed perfect to start a congregation, the worshippers believed that the islands had supernatural powers. It was a place fueled by what many still believe was a place of fairies. Let's go! Fairies. Because of its reputation and the superstition surrounding it, rituals such as circling the church on your knees were adopted by these worshippers. What? Yeah. Like, can you imagine (laughs) stumbling up on this church on an island in the middle of nowhere and these people are just circling it on like walking on their knees i, I kind of hope they got their like little arms flapping like a chicken dance kind of thing i would just keep <laughs> sailing by yeah see ya don't want to do so that. there was a definite presence of some sort an aura that undeniably just hung over the island so although the saint tended to his flock on Eileen Moore. The foundation was short-lived. It's rumored that the saint, along with his followers, left the island due to supernatural sightings of these fairies. Um, the only thing that the saint and the congregation left behind was the church and a flock of sheep. So They just left the poor sheep? Yes. Who are they, Joe Exotic? Right, exactly. <laughs> so now let's jump forward 1,500 years back to the story at hand. Okay. So the ship that was coming up to the island, it carried supplies and a a change crew, but due to the storm, this was delayed. So this ship that was supposed to come with supplies and a new crew for the lighthouse, it was delayed three days because of how bad these storms were. But when storms came through, like that wasn't rare. So it's not like the, the people working there were like, oh my gosh, something happened to them. It's just like, no, they're bad storms. This is what happens. Like, They don't come till the storms have passed. When the ship arrived at Eileen Moore, there was no sight of the three lighthouse keepers. 
Captain James Harvey, who was the one in charge of the supply ship, blew his horn and sent up a warning flare to attract attention, thinking, like, again, they might just, because they weren't ready for these people to be here, maybe they're just not paying attention. So, under totally normal circumstances, someone should have been waiting at the front of the lighthouse to welcome the ship. It all seemed off. The interior of the lighthouse itself was as should be, with oil in the lamps waiting to be lit, ashes in the grate. The only thing that appeared out of the ordinary was the two sets of missing oil skins. Oil skins are like the coats that they would wear outdoors. They're like heavy oil slicked coats for like oh, when to, these people to protect are... from the rain and things yeah. like that. So two of them were missing, but one was still there. Uh, but none of obviously none of the the men were there, which means that one of them went outside in a terrible storm in just street clothes. Which okay. not only is like stupid, but it's also illegal because according to the Northern Lighthouse Board, that it is law that one man must remain in the lighthouse at all times. Okay. So and they, they like knew that and they were they're very like, you know, strict and that's their job to guard the lighthouse and you know Lighthouse you know, dude shit. Yes. <laughs> So Captain James Harvey quickly sent a telegram back to mainland, which in turn was forwarded to the Northern Lighthouse Board headquarters in Edinburgh. And the telegraph read, A dreadful accident has happened at Flannan's. The three keepers, Ducat, Marshall, and the occasional, whatever that means, have disappeared from the island. On our arrival there this afternoon, no sign of life was to be seen on the island. Wow. Fired a rocket, but as no response was made, managed to land upon more who went up to the station but found no keepers there the clocks were stopped and other signs indicate that the accident must have happened about a week ago oh they probably had to wind their clocks back then right yeah oh okay i'm like how does that even happen right poor fellows they must have been blown over the cliffs or drowned trying to secure a crane or something like that night coming on we cannot wait to make something of their fate um and then he just goes on to say like some other stuff that isn't really important. A few days later, <laughs> Robert Muir head, the board superintendent, both knew, like they knew those men personally. So they were okay. like, we're going to go search this island. We like, we want to know what happened. So his investigation, they're going to get found, shit done. Exactly. They found nothing over and beyond what Captain Moore already told them, except they found the lighthouse log. And that, opened up some new mysteries. So Ooh. on the 12th of December, Thomas Marshall, the second assistant, wrote of severe winds, the likes of which I've never seen in my 20 years. They also noticed that James Decat, the principal keeper who had been, had been, quote, very quiet, and that the third assistant, William MacArthur, had been crying. What is strange about the final remark about MacArthur is that he was a seasoned mariner and known on the Scottish mainland as being a tough brawler. so And he's just bawling in the lighthouse. Sobbing. <laughs> <laughs> log entries okay, on but the... the... Go, Go ahead. ahead. No, you'll tell me. I know. <laughs> so on the log entries of the 13th of December stated that the storm was still raging and that all three men had been praying. But why would three experienced lighthouse keepers, safely situated in a brand new lighthouse, mind you, that was 150 feet yeah. above the sea level be praying for a storm to stop when one they know they're totally safe two they've done this for years like whoa yeah and the, and to the point that they wrote in their logbook like we're all praying What's but they're crazier, not saying why yet correct just apparently these storms okay they're all like so concerned about these storms but again they've done this job for 20 years like Right. It's just lighthouse dude shit. Right. So what's even crazier is that there were no reported storms in that area on the 12th, 13th, or 14th of December. In Get fact, the, fuck the weather out. was calm, and the storms that hit the island that affected that delivery ship didn't hit until December 17th. So what? why on the 13th of December were they reporting these crazy storms that they were praying to stop? 
the final log entry was made on the 15th of December, and it all it read, this is literally it, storm ended, sea calm, God is over all. That's all it said. Really? And that was the last thing that, that was said of them. So the investigators concluded that, and this part pisses me off, that two men must have gone outside during the storm and fell over the side of the cliffs or were swept away by the waves. The third man ran out to rescue them, but was swept away as well. That's just like what they put in the official investigation. Okay, but gotcha. There's no proof to the story that's ever appeared in the explanation because I guess the Northern Lighthouse Board is still a thing. They're still unconvinced. Like, essentially, they just copped out of, of the investigation. Many are still wondering. Because they had no answers. Yeah, but they, like, made an official report. Like, oh, this is what happened. They didn't know. Mm-hmm. But in this cluster of islands, being so relatively close to Scotland mainland, why didn't anybody's wash ashore eventually? like Right. No, it is, absolutely. It's literally as if they just walked off the island. Um, over the following decades, subsequent lighthouse keepers at Eileen Moore have reported strange voices in the wind, calling out the names of the three dead men. Several speculations emerge, but the fact remains that these three guys are still MIA. And yeah, they were never ever seen again. Once you started telling the story, it kind of sounded familiar, but... I. I Maybe it was a different story I saw. I'm assuming mysteries at the museum, but it was similar. So there was, it was three men. There was a Go movie. Ahead. There was a movie that was made, sort of like about it, called The Disappearance. I guess. Oh, that island is gorgeous, though. I just got the text. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, wow. but it's not. It's not a large island. No. But also, if you like, just walked outside of the lighthouse, it's not like you would just immediately fall off a cliff. Like there is plenty of no. land. God, that's stunning. <laughs> I know. It's kind of like almost where Luke Skywalker ran away to. <laughs> Literally <somewhere. laughs> what I was just thinking. <laughs> um, but I guess like if you went outside and the winds were like crazy, crazy strong. But I, it's not going to just no. sweep you off the island. No, no. Not I at think all. the fairies I, the thing... picked them up and carried them away. Must have. Or maybe they're, you know, on, you know, some alien ship somewhere. Who knows? Uh, the one I had seen, I, they explained it as the the one guy went missing. And it's probably a completely different story. And if it yeah. is, I will look it up and maybe do it at some point. But it was the three guys. And one of them just disappeared. Like, they couldn't find him. He All his stuff was still there. That's why I started thinking it was the same thing when you said the two coats were missing, but the one coat was still there. And then um, the two guys went out looking for him. And then they fell off the cliffs. So maybe it's just another version of what could have happened. I don't know. But I thought there was writing about how one of the guys had just disappeared in the logs or whatever it was. So, well, the very um, similar, if not very similar. Well, because I read, you know, four different versions of the story as we do when we're (laughs) looking up. Right. (laughs) Um, and some said, like, that when that captain first walked into the lighthouse, like, they heard, or he heard, like, sounds inside. And, like, there are all these folklore-esque stories. Um, right. But there was, like, a full plate of food on the dining room table for one person. Um, yeah, which is I think it is the same story. Um, because it's, like, if they all three were there, why would there only be a plate for one um, yeah, it's just overall really odd. And yes. the craziest part was the whole storms not being reported on those days. Yeah, absolutely. Which is I really the creepiest thing of it all to me. Yes. And because, I mean, even if they're that far off the shore, you would see the storm. I would think. Right. I, I mean, but, or like other, um, like sailors would have reported having to sail around them or through them or, and there were no reports at all. And these crazy storms that delayed that boat didn't come four days later. Right. Oh no. Got to leave the glasses on if we're recording this. Sorry. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) 
that's a great story. Thank you so much for that. Now I, I am going to have to find that episode. And if I find it, I'll uh, send you a link to it so you yeah, can check please. it out. Because maybe it's just another option to the story. That's true. Now, did you mention at the beginning, is it is like that island haunted to this day or anything? So in 1971, that's when they started automating lighthouses. So okay. n- people aren't out there anymore. Oh, it's literally um, like where Luke Skywalker lives, lived now. Yeah. <laughs> I want to move there. And again, the size of the island, it's not like it's somewhere you would go vacation. <laughs> you have to be wanting to go to that island. <laughs> <laughs> I'm obsessed with lighthouses, so maybe I shall vacation there. We'll see. Ooh. Maybe we should just like do a, a, a weekend sleepover there and see if it's haunted. Wow. Catch a fairy. Catch a fairy then... to see the fairies. See what I did there? <laughs> and then... <laughs> We get swept off this island. Yeah, let's not. Okay, and bad we're like, idea. Damn it, we said that this couldn't happen. <laughs> oh shit! Well, I've got a story, and I'm not going to talk about it because I've been listening to our podcast lately, and I always repeat myself. So I'm just going to just fucking go for it. In this extra time off, I've been saddled with. Um, I was able to catch the newest movie of the Conjuring series, Annabelle Comes Home. Have you seen it? I have not. Okay. It's it's pretty good. It's like on HBO Now or Go or one of those things where I've been watching everything lately. But it, surprisingly, like I said, it wasn't terrible. This one flew completely under the radar for me as I didn't even know that there was another Annabelle movie out. But it was good. It had a bit of a Brady Bunch vibe, which I was all for as it's based um, in the 70s. But I like how it focused on Ed and Lorraine Warren's daughter – And what it was like growing up with parents whose lives and world revolved around the paranormal. So it was it was a neat concept, if you will, especially being a parent into the paranormal. Yeah, Um, I know. I know these movies take major liberties and I have a feeling this one was a complete work of fiction, but I was totally entertained and even cried a little at the end. Won't give away anything, but it was really good and hit really close to home for me. Um, We've all heard me go on and on about the amazing couple, Ed and Lorraine Warren. But for those of you who didn't know, in 1952, the Warrens founded the New England Society for Psychic Research, the oldest ghost hunting group in New England. They authored numerous books about the paranormal and about their private investigations into various reports of paranormal activity. They're said to have investigated over 10,000 cases in their career. So crazy. Which, I mean, is that like they're doing three a day, taking weekends off? I don't even know how you would fit that many investigations into a lifetime. I mean, holy shit. They are the people who investigated the Amityville Horror House, the Enfield Poltergeist, the Perron Family Home, which inspired the Conjuring movie, of course. Uh, the Smurl Family Haunting, which I covered in episode 11 called Otherworldly. And of course, the story of Annabelle and what seems like a bazillion others. In the movies, Annabelle is hella, is a hella creepy porcelain doll who looks like she's seen some shit not gonna lie (laughs) but the real life annabelle is a child size good old-fashioned raggedy ann doll i mean i totally had one of those as a little girl and andy too so what exactly happened to this sweet doll i'm pretty sure the real life story is way more scary than the movie and that story goes a little something like this in 1970 Donna was a nursing student. She lived in an apartment with her friend and roommate, Angie. Donna received this ridiculously large doll as a birthday gift from her mother. I mean, it was like toddler size, like your nephew's like yeah. size, like three feet. T- I don't even know. Huge. So she gave her this ridiculously large doll as a birthday gift from her mother. She received it from her mother. Um, Which just raises questions. A grown-ass college student getting a Raggedy Ann doll from her mother. I just think Tupperware would have been a better choice. But, you know, what else? (laughs) So Donna welcomes the new doll with open arms. She even gives her a special spot in her apartment. Her bed. And that's not the creepy part. Um, Over time, Donna would notice that Raggedy Ann would slightly change positions. Like her legs would go from straight out in front of her to crossed. Or instead of 
sitting up like Donna had left the doll. She'd be laying on her side. But really not a big deal because maybe the doll fell over on her own. But things started to get super creepy after that. There would be parchment paper on the floor of Donna's bedroom floor on several occasions. And written on the paper were messages like, help me and help us, which totally stumped the girls. They had no parchment paper in the house. I mean, who has parchment paper even in the 70s? Right. But then the doll started showing up in different rooms in the apartment. Isn't the whole thing with her like writing on paper, isn't that in like the beginning of one of the movies? It, like... Yes, this whole, yeah, but it's, I think it's a little exaggerated and well, it doesn't yeah. go into this, this depth right. of it. Okay, but then the doll started showing up in different rooms in the apartment and on one occasion seemed to be leaking blood. I mean, what in the actual fuck balls, Batman? (laughs) Several drops of blood were found on the doll's hand and chest. When I I had to research to find out what the actual leaking of blood consisted of, because that seemed a little (laughs) freaky to me. Um, But it's like somebody dripped blood on her. So it's not nearly as scary as it would have been in the movies. (laughs) So the girls first thought it was an intruder playing tricks on them. Or maybe even the apartment maintenance workers. Which is the real scary thought here. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. I mean, what sick bastard would do that? But they ruled it out. I'm not sure how, but the interwebs interwebs told me they ruled it out. So we're just going to go with that. I still want to know more details. Don't have them. But wait, there's more. Of course. (laughs) Lou, who's Angie's fiance, was napping in the apartment one day. And he woke up to the doll all up in his personal space. Like all up in his griddle. Right up in his face, just staring at him. Are you kidding me? I hate that. <laughs> I know. I It's never happened to me, but I would hate it. And to add insult to, to creepy injury, he felt like he was being choked oh. by an, an unseen set of hands. Ew. So you've no. got Annabelle all up in here, and nobody's touching you, but you're being choked. A thank you, no. Oh, I would okay. burn it. <laughs> yeah. So with all that... Uh, what else is there to do? But you contact a spirit medium, right? I'm just saying. Right. That would have been my go-to about five creepy instances ago, but that's just me. So the medium shows up. She holds a seance, as they did in the 70s. And she was told and relayed to the girls the story of Annabelle Higgins. It was said that she was the spirit of a young girl who had died in a car crash on that property back before the uh, apartments were even built. On the property. Okay. And Annabelle told the medium that she felt comfortable there with the girls, felt at home in the apartment, and that she just wanted to stay with them and be loved. Well, let's not choke people and let's get rid of the blood. (laughs) Exactly. Um, I mean it's it it sounds sweet and Oh they start. You know me, I'd fall for that shit. Yeah. I know. (laughs) And then I'd be the one to die. (laughs) No. So what else could the roommates do but welcome her and give her permission to inhabit the doll? But we know better, don't we? There's no happily freaking ever after here in the paranormal world, kids. So the girls treated the doll like she was the seven-year-old girl who they thought she had, who they thought she had was and found solace in the doll. They nurtured it. They loved it. And in turn, the doll acted like a typical child. One day, the girls left Annabelle in the living room. They go off to do nursing student things. And then they come back home and find Annabelle in Donna's room with the door shut. And she's in the corner. You know, typical haunted doll temper tantrum stuff. Don't leave me here. You know. Right. That's what I'm seeing going down. And then shit got even more real. One day, Lou and Angie were studying maps to prepare for a trip Lou was going on the next day. When they heard rustling noises coming from Donna's room, I'm assuming Donna wasn't home. It didn't say, but I'm assuming. Lou approached the closed door and waited for the noises to stop before entering. He turned on the light and saw Annabelle laying on the floor in a corner. He walked over to the doll, but as he did, he began to sense that someone was behind him. So quick turnaround. He spins around, but no one's there. And in an instant, he found himself doubled over, grabbing his chest, which was now bleeding. He was bleeding? He was bleeding. 
Upon inspection, he discovered seven claw-like scratches on his chest, four horizontal and three vertical, that were hot like burns. The scratches healed rapidly and were completely gone in two days. Are there pictures? Not that I saw. Okay. It was the 70s. I mean, there might be Polaroids, but probably not a digital copy. Um, Again, this is why the Warrens are so controversial. People say, oh, it's all made up shit. And I'm like, oh, tell me more. I believe it all. Right. Okay. I mean, what if Lou was a dick? Maybe the little girl was just trying to warn poor Angie. We do not even know. Yeah. Trying to see the bright side there. Because the little girl died in a car crash. Maybe she didn't want Angie going on a road trip. Ooh, look at you. (laughs) I like that. Okay. So after all that goes down, Donna came to the realization that the spirit might not be all that innocent. She contacted an Episcopal, uh, (laughs) that's hard to say, an Episcopal priest named Father Hagen, who contacted a superior, Father Cook, who immediately got in touch with paranormal researchers Ed and Lorraine Warren. Who else? Bring in the big guns, guys. The Warrens came to the immediately conclude the uh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I've not been speaking a whole lot lately, so um, the Warrens came to the immediate conclusion upon meeting Annabelle that the doll itself was not possessed by a sweet seven-year-old baby angel, but it was being manipulated by an inhuman presence as always happens with the Warrens. So, I mean, take it or leave it. And they felt that the entity was not looking to stay attached to the doll. And if they hadn't been called, it would have possessed a human host, which was its plan all along. Bum, bum, but, bum. Exactly. But Lorraine's a psychic medium. So, I mean, she goes in and she gets these visions and let's just go with that. The Warrens convinced Father Cook to perform an exorcism on the apartment in order to cleanse the home. He also blessed the individuals who were there. At Donna's request, the Warrens took the Raggedy Ann doll with them when they departed. Ed placed the demon doll in the back seat of their car and mentions to Lorraine that they should probably take the back roads home because it was going to be a rough ride. And he was right. On their ride home, Annabelle seemed to possess the car shutting off the power to the steering wheel and brakes. What? And it was only happening on dangerous curves. Naturally. So imagine driving down Burma in this car possessed by Annabelle. And your brakes go out. <laughs> exactly. Or power steering. Or, ugh. Ugh, sounds terrible. That, that um, road in Colorado Springs. Nope. On the way. <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Now you want to be on Burma. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So... Uh, Ed pulled the, I will pull this car over, and he did, and he doused her in holy water, and they made it home safe. <laughs> I love it so You think he would have started with that. Yeah, you know. Um, so, you know, all the stories and all the, the movies, Annabelle is this evil, possessed doll who kills people left and right. Yeah. So I had to look up, did Annabelle ever, ever kill anyone? I mean, the death toll in the movies was pretty steep. Mm -hmm. Here's the only story I could find on that. The Warrens fully believed that she had. When a visitor to the museum laughed at the doll and banged on the case the Warrens kept her in, he was asked to leave by Ed himself, like, get the fuck out, respect this shit. And he and his girlfriend were riding on his motorcycle and laughing about the doll. He lost control, ran into a tree, and died instantly. Wow. The girlfriend survived, but she was hospitalized with severe injuries for a year. Um, And there was one documented close call. When a visiting priest dismissed the doll's powers, he was involved in a near-fatal accident on the way home. His brakes gave out in a busy intersection, and his vehicle was destroyed. Don't fuck with haunted dolls. We learned that with Robert the doll. So crazy. So since the Warren's passing, their son-in-law, Tony Spira, has taken over their legacy and claims that Annabelle is the most terrifying artifact that they ever owned. Wow. And there's so much. So I would give my right arm to just 
go to the, it's closed now. The museum is closed. Once Lorraine passed, I think they closed it. But wow. they have all the good stuff. Yeah. I didn't know they like permanently closed it. I thought it was just like a temporary thing. I don't know. I, I Googled uh, just the museum itself and it said permanently closed. You know how wow. Google does. Yeah. That's nuts. Absolutely insane. But thanks for the assist to Google, Google Wikipedia, filmdaily.co, history versus Hollywood.com, films filmschoolrejects.com and nhregister.com I mean I knew most of that story sure um, but there were pieces where I was like ooh I didn't know that I know it is one it's funny because naturally like Hollywood has to make has to over exaggerate things the doll itself for example um, yeah which I think Raggedy Ann is creepier Raggedy Ann is creepy um, I know how many are there three Annabelle movies now I never saw the first one, but I've seen two and three. Okay. So, so the yeah. second one is the one out, like, at that, like, it's the prequel, right? The orphanage. Oh. Like, it's in the desert? Yes. Like is there the a well? Like, West? Yes. And, like, a shed? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because. That one I've that, seen. The clip where it's, like, the little girl's, like, running around the house and, the woman like has come to terms that like she's okay with it and then looks like in the reflection of something and sees like this little demon with its head around the corner. Nope. And when she turns around like the little girl run like she sees the little girl run away, I was like, Absolutely not. Burn the house no. down. And if real paranormal shit like went down like that, I would not do this. Mm mm. Nope. nope. If I saw a little <laughs> devil baby, absolutely not. Hell to the no. Um, yeah, and every time I watch those movies, I'm all like, well, you know, that shit never happens to us and this, that, and the other. But if it did, we wouldn't be doing this right now. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to put I that out there. I think that's what's in the basement at Higginsport, though. <laughs> Something Demon really dolls. close to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Um, let me find a story. Okay. Uh, says my favorite peeps i hope you all you all are well i have a paranormal story for you and it goes a little something like this he puts in quotes Squee! <laughs> my wife and i purchased our first home in 1997 straight out of high school at the ripe age of 18 and 19 years old Aww. we had looked at the house several times before closing on it and did not get any strange vibes from the property the house itself is in minnesota it was built in 1824 by a mr fitzgerald he was a prominent figure who started the WSP Township. Well, he's a fancy Later to fucker. Later named the city of West St. Paul. It's your typical A-frame two-story farmhouse with a choppy layout and small rooms. Constructed this way as they often did to prevent drafts to make it easier to heat in the winter months. It was the only house with, within a 50-mile radius. Yeah. Kind of like my house. <laughs> the house at the time set on hundreds of acres of flat of a flat field. At the front of the house, on the first floor, was what would have been a very small sitting room, connected dining room in the center of the first floor, with a small kitchen and butler's pantry at the back of the house to complete the first floor layout. In between the dining room and the kitchen was a small was a wall separating the kitchen from the dining room, with a staircase that you could easily access only from the kitchen. It was a small, narrow, steep staircase leading up to the bedrooms on the second floor. At the top of the stairs to the right, was a master bedroom. During that time, they often built houses where you had to pass through the master bedroom to get to another bedroom, which was the exact layout of ours. To the left of the stairs was a small bathroom, obviously added added on later, and a small bedroom. In the basement, the foundation was built of stacked limestone, and the basement was a partial basement, which consisted of the front half of the house being mounted on dirt, and the back half was dug out to form a small room for cold storage. In the weeks leading up to us closing on the property, both of us began having reoccurring dreams about the house. Both of our dreams were very different from one another. My wife's dreams involved her going down into the basement where she turned to the left, viewing the front half of the house, so the dirt part, and she would see two small girls having a tea party with a small table and chairs on top of the dirt mound. They were both wearing white dresses. Yes. They were both wearing white dresses, and he has in parentheses, of course, (laughs) but not your ordinary white dresses. She would describe them in detail, 
They had lace covering over top a cotton linen fabric. Both girls had pink ribbons in their hair. One of the girls had blonde hair curled, the other dark straight hair. They would look at my wa- wife and ask her to join them. Oh. As she started to walk towards them, she'd always wake up from the same moment every time before reaching them. She had this dream almost nightly. Oh, shit. And he says, I, on the other hand, had a much darker dream. It was almost as if I was looking through someone else's eyes as he lived his life. I did not have nearly the details of my wife. My dream always seemed foggy. I'm not sure who this man was, but he liked to abuse women and children, specifically two small girls. Oh, Everyone God. was dressed in period clothing, but they were all dirty as if they had been working in the fields. I was not able to make out any faces. My dream always consisted of a woman in what, in what would be our house, crouched down in between the small sitting room and dining room, next to a wood stove sobbing, and he wailed on her from behind. Oh, the shit. The other scene that I would often see was him chasing the girls as they were running away from him. He always caught them. Typically in the field behind the house, he would beat them and drag, drag them back into the home. Wow. Yeah. Both of these dreams lasted until the day we closed on the house. That night after closing in May, it was a hot, humid night. Our house did not have any air at all. We had all the windows open, but there was no breeze. We were busy unpacking with every light on in the house. Um, I was in what would have been the dining room back in the day, so the small sitting room at the front of the house, and the dining room turned into one large room at some point. As the house had been completely remodeled except for the original windows, six six panel doors and trim. The room I was in backed right up to the kitchen at the back of the house. I was sitting on the floor unpacking our CD towers, not more than 10 feet away from my wife. My wife was in the kitchen unpacking the dishes. As I was sitting there listening to the sound of clanging dishes, this extremely cold breeze rushed across my legs. I was just about to ask if she had found a fan, and in that split second before I got the words out, every single light went off in our house. No. She screamed from the kitchen, Honey, you're not funny. Turn the lights back on. I could barely get words out as every hair on my body was standing up, but I managed to squeak out, I'm still sitting here unpacking the CD tower. Oh my God. She, when she realized from the sound of my voice that I was that I was right there, she screamed, turn the fucking lights back on. And every <laughs> single light came back on. What? We knew that it was not a power outage because in the moments of complete darkness, we could see the glow from the neighbor's lights looking Back on this, we should have realized that that was just the beginning. We got married a year after we bought the house, and over the two and a half years we lived there, it seemed any time we'd fight or argue, the lights would always flicker or completely go out. We had several contractors out to inspect our panel and wiring, but since the entire house was all rewired before a move-in, every single one of them said that we were up to code, everything's fine with the wiring, blah, 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 blah. No! <laughs> After we married, I kept having dreams of this skeleton woman standing in our bedroom doorway wearing my wife's wedding dress. She just no! stood there watching, but this dream never progressed at all. One night, my wife went upstairs to go to bed. Even though the master bedroom was quite large, it was awkwardly laid out with dormered ceilings. So she was the only one with a nightstand and a lamp on her side of the bed. I had a tiny path on my side of the bed where I could just get in and out. Okay. She... As she turned out the lamp that night, immediately I felt this cold permeating through the comforter coming from the bottom left corner of the bed. Then Mm -mm. I felt the bed sink as if someone sat on the corner of it. I screamed, turn on the lamp. (laughs) She hit the lamp and saw that I had goosebumps everywhere and I was pale. Panic striking as I looked at the bottom of the bed to see if I could see anything. Both of us looked and you could see an indent where it looked like someone was sitting on the corner of the bed. We Mm -hmm. immediately left and drove to her mother's house. Yes! (laughs) Yes! <laughs> of course, being young and dumb, we decided to read the deed. We even went to the historical society and looked at property records, which was surprising to find out that even though this was the first was the first house built, they had nothing on it other than what was in the deed. So back, back then you were actually given the paper deed to the house listing all original documents of the owner records from, his, from the history of the home. Not much information was collected on the deed from the early days other than the owner's name, date purchased, and sold. One thing that did stick out to us was that up until the 1920s, deaths in the home were recorded on the deed. Mr. Fitzgerald, who built the house, died in the home. 
Miss Sarah Winslow purchased the home from Fitz the Fitzgerald estate, and she also perished in the home. Over the years, many prominent, modest families lived in the home, whose names would later make up street names and all that in that town. Oh, wow. So they all perished in the home as well. Oh, shit. The street name that the house resides on today is Winslow. So throughout the two and a half years of us living there, we got used to the lights going on and off every now and then um, because it really only happened when we were arguing. The one thing that we were never able to shake or get over was the feeling that someone was always standing behind you or watching you. It got to the point that when we would be vacuuming, especially, we'd have to close every door behind us <laughs> of the room that they're vacuuming. What? So the bedroom at the back of the house was always a guest room, but off limits to us. We would not go back there unless we had to. The feeling was heavy, uneasy, much different vibe from the rest of the house. So let's make this the guest room. <laughs> right. In the course of two and a half years, my anger always grew towards my wife. We were fighting and arguing a lot, especially over money and finances. Every little thing she did would set me off. It got to the point at the end of the two and a half years, we decided to separate and list the home, thinking that that time we were too young and the pressures of home ownership was just always causing us to fight. It sold immediately, and the day of closing, I set to head to my parents in the Dakotas for a couple weeks, and she was going to stay with her parents. Immediately following the signing of the paper over to the new owners, this massive weight just fell off my shoulders. I felt Whoa. this overwhelming rush of I don't know what, almost to the point of passing out. Not knowing if it was because my marriage was failing due to my attitude, selling our house, or not knowing what the future would hold. I was noticeable as my wife even commented, what the fuck is wrong with you? After closing, yeah. I jumped in my car and drove the long five hours to my parents' home. Upon arriving, I had a few beers with my dad, and I decided I would settle in for the night. The second my head hit the pillow my, at my parents, my phone rang. I remember looking at the clock, knowing it was 3.20 a.m. It was my wife. She was in hysterics. After a few minutes of trying to calm her down, she told me what was wrong. She had the dream again. She hadn't had that dream since the night we moved in. Of the two little girls having a tea party in the basement on the dirt mound, dressed in white dresses. She approached them this time and didn't wake up, and both of them looked at her and said, Why did you leave us? <gasps> no! I packed up and drove back to Minnesota the next morning. We never actually ended up separating, and everything, including my attitude, calmed down after the sale of the house. We ended up um, being together for 23 years, married for 17. Um, she passed away in 2016. Oh, I'm so we sorry. We never found out who they were or what they wanted, nor did we have any other experiences or dreams about the house the day after closing. Thanks for reading and listening. Reach out if you have any questions. Uh, love you guys. Keep doing what you're doing. Barry. Barry. Yes, it was a long story, but holy shit. <laughs> it was so, it's a movie. You need to write a screenplay off that. That is crazy. Wow. Wow. And the fact that she was able to see the little girls in the end and and then they're like, why did you leave? Oh, I can't even. Right. You would have gone back. I would have been. I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker for a ghost in need, apparently. <laughs> I wonder if if they just like if it would have been smart or not smart to try to like talk to them. I mean, or, it's in your yeah. home, so I wouldn't have either. I know, I know. That's where I'm at with these shadows. I don't know if I should whip out the damn spirit box and figure out what the hell it is, or just, just I feel like go they with want it. you to get the spirit box out. I think you should just keep saging and just doing that. Okay. I mean, had you added anything new to the shelf? No, but I will say, I'm going to grab it right now, just because we're running video, I can show you. I've had this ring for a minute. I bought it when I was collecting all the oddities. It's actually a mourning ring. So a child would have had to have died and the parents would have put the child's hair in this ring. I don't know if you can oh my gosh, see that or not. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll post a, a take a picture of it and post it in our stories as well at Oddity Files yeah. on Instagram. But I recently came across this. And it was sitting on my desk here when when I was recording that. So I don't know. I've I've really been trying to figure it out without pulling out the odd box, you know. The equipment. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. One day I'll probably break down and be like, "Babe, just go for a drive. I gotta I gotta deal with some shit here." <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah. 
So, you know, if there's any, Marjorie, you're listening. Tell me what you're feeling. What are your vibes? Tiff, same thing. Tiff, is, she still thinks it was my dogs, which I don't know. I just have a, a different vibe in this office than I used to. So, you know, it's a good thing we're recording hmm. remotely. Yeah, no kidding. That's weird. I don't know. But there you go. There's our, our first quarantine <laughs> remotely recorded podcast. We yeah. took video of this. It'll end up on our Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash oddity files. Um, you get to see all the uncut, all the shit, all the stuff, all the things, and me in GIF mode, apparently. <laughs> yeah. um, you guys, thank you so much for listening, for watching, for just being you guys. Yeah, seriously, we we can't thank you enough. Um, especially through hard times, it's just cool, and it feels good to have like a community around you. Absolutely, I could not agree more. But on that note, where does the new cool? Goodbye. Ghost on. Oddity Files is an independent production. Intro music created by DJ Jimmy. Wah wah. Twenty twenty artwork. Created by me, Kitsy Duncan. The opinions expressed in this podcast are ours and ours alone. Well, maybe yours too. If you like the show and would like to support us, visit oddityfiles.com and click on support. Or go to patreon.com slash oddityfiles. Every little bit helps with both the podcast and the TV show. You can also support us by watching Oddity Files on Amazon Prime. It's free to Prime members and dirt cheap to those who aren't. You can find us on all the social media sites at Oddity Files. Keep spreading the word by sharing, retweeting, and reposting. Join our Oddity Files Facebook group by searching Oddity Files Fan Group and click join. We'll approve you as soon as we can. All weirdos are welcome. Not into that social media stuff? Tell your coworkers, family, even the weird guy who just won't stop talking to you in line for coffee. Oh, and grandma, your grandma will love us. We appreciate each and every one of you. And if it weren't for you, we have no idea what we would do with our lives. If you have a story you'd like to submit, send it on in at oddityfilescrew at gmail.com. Also, send in story ideas, silly, weird memes, or just positive vibes to oddityfilescrew at gmail.com. You can also call in and leave that in a voicemail. Call us at 317-300-6699. To contact us about an appearance, reach out at kitsy at oddityfiles.com. When you have a sec, rate, review, and subscribe. We know it doesn't sound like much, but it really helps us get up there on the podcasting charts. And remember, kids, weird is the new cool. Ghost on. Um, why are you still here? Go on. Get out of here. Turn it off. It's done. Really? I swear. Go. Get. Serious. I'm out of here.